credit, but I really can't. I mean, it was Peter and Fran's idea to do two films of the three books. Mm -hmm. They had 280 page screenplays, that was the thought. And then when Miramax at the time wouldn't do it, it was actually my boss at New Line, Bob Shea, who had the thought, three books, why aren't you making three films? So, and honestly, the background behind why I do it is that New Line actually as a company had real trouble making sequels of its famous films like The Mask and Dumb and Dumber. It was causing great frustration. So the idea, apart from that Lord of the Rings was worth making and Peter Jackson was the man to make it with, this was a chance to essentially make sequels in advance of, you know. But the inherent risk is almost crazy. It's a gamble almost too big to make. If the first film had tanked, what would you have done with the other two films? I would have originally killed. <laughs> like the biblical scapegoat. Um, you know, it, it was a huge risk. Um, New Line was very, very smart about how they leveraged the financial risk of it. But yeah, if the first film had failed, we would have had the other two films in the can, and it would have been, it would have been very, very challenging. You spent how many years in New Zealand on this project? Five years. And did you pick up a Kiwi accent at the end? No, I picked up a Kiwi wife. Yes! <laughs> Woo! So awesome. <laughs> She's lovely, by the way. She's That's great. She's lovely. lovely. You've been blessed. Mm -hmm. Now, describe to me your first meeting with Andrew Lesney. Uh, I, it would have been during pre-production. Mm -hmm. um, and I just remember what everyone remembers about him. It's just, he was grace and humor and unflappable and nothing faced him even when they did face him. Really, at the end of the day, filmmakers that are doing incredibly challenging and ambitious things want people that say yes to whatever the challenge is. That's what they want to hear. They want to hear yes and how you're going to do it. And the great thing about Andrew is he always had the way to make it yes and do it unbelievably beautifully. Indeed. So in a high tension environment, with so much at stake mm. and so many unknown factors, Andrew Lesney, as a photographer, as a professional in filmmaking, he managed to be cool as a cucumber the whole time. Yeah, he was absolutely, I mean, never saw him sweat. I think he, he manifested stress in just a very elegant way. He just made it about the work. Yeah, he was known for his sense of humor as well. Yes, for sure. Yes. I was actually the second AD on his one acting. You, you know what the Sean Aston short film is along in the short film? Along in the short film, I love that piece. Right. You guys know that short film that Sean Aston did? It's lovely. Yes, yeah, so, so, yeah, so, I mean, I actually was the second AD. I was a very poor second AD. I never hired me to be your second AD. But I did fetch coffee well, but the rest of the job I did very poorly. Um, but yeah, Sean thought it would be funny to take everyone and flip them around. So, like, Andrew's a cinematographer, so he should be an actor. Mm -hmm. Mark's like the executive producer, he should be a second AD getting coffee. I thought it was kind of awesome. Did, did you notice something unique about the relationship between the director and his director's photography? Uh, when listening to the commentary track, Andrew Lesney tells an amazing anecdote about how Peter insists on keeping the camera moving. In, middle, in When other directors would keep a static shot, Andrew said, I'm constantly challenged by Peter, but I'm always enlightened by what he's doing yeah. with forcing the camera to be in constant movement. In yeah, it was constant movement, and also Peter Peter would just say, the camera's going to be here. I remember with Gollum, mm -hmm. in the early days of Gollum, like we're going to do a close-up and all the visual effects people would write and go, we're not going to be able to sustain the close-up. Mm -hmm. you know, like, but it didn't matter. Peter would, the great thing about it is he would simply say, we're going to put the camera here and it's going to be moving. And not like in a, you're not like in a dickish way, like in a, we're going to aspire to this. And by doing it that way, and Steve Jobs out here was, was a similar dynamic. Yes. We're going to do this, and then everyone rose beyond their capacities. People did more than they thought they would be able to do because Peter challenged them. And I think every great artist does it that way. And I think it's reflected in the film. Can you describe one of your favorite shots that Andrew photographed? Because I can quickly come up with one. When Theoden has his speech, he's staring off in the distance, where is the horse and the rider? And Andrew has this bright, bright light all behind him coming through a doorway, and it almost seems like this angelic glowing. Yeah. And, and our lovely friend Bruce Hopkins is helping place the gauntlets and the armor on the king. But there's still activity. There's people and soldiers who step into that light, and there's some kind of business. And you know that there's still tension and strife right outside the door, even in the middle of getting a very placid and beautiful angelic shot yeah. of Bernard Hill. You still have people changing the light behind him, with the, 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 the suggestion that there's still so much tension right outside the door, behind his back. You know? God is so mad with my word. 
again. I mean, one of them is an extended edition, like the one when when and Frodo and Sam are, are trekking through and and they see the decapitated, you know, stone statue, which is becomes crowned with a light, hits it, and there's flowers, and it's uncrowned again. Uh, Vigo coming through the doors, you know, in so much, which was in every trailer. Yes, you were. Yes. When, when Andrew died, I tweeted that image of the golden flowers over the statue's head being lit and then dimmed. I put that picture up. One of the first things I thought of. Also, Andrew, yes. the, the Lord of the Rings was also, there was a there was digital coloring of Lord of the Rings, because Lord of the Rings was shot on film, which is like, like so, you know, which doesn't exist anymore. anymore. Except for, I think, Christopher Nolan, maybe. Might be one of the few still. Tarantino's giving us yeah. eight eighty seventy million years. So, so what you do is once it was shot, then you know, then um, Andrew and, and, and Peter Jackson and, and the film would be would be digitally colored, and it was an amazing, painstaking but beautiful. It's like it was painterly. So you got really two chances to go with the image. What's most impressive is that Peter Jackson decided to hire Andrew Leslie on the strength of his photography on Babe. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. that'll do, Babe. The reason why. Peter Jackson is quoted as saying, if someone can take a simple farm and make it look as magical and idyllic as Andrew did, that's the guy for me. Yeah, yeah that is really fantastic. Uh, tell me, what, what, what was your last thought that you wanted to tell me about uh, Mr. Leslie? Uh, so yeah, no, no, I thought about it. I mean, my last thought of Andrew is always that he improbably thanked me from the Oscar stage for Fellowship of the Ring, which I remember being wonderfully moved and touched by, but remember thinking when um, when he passed, I should have been thanking him every day. Um, you know, you say thanks to the movies, you know, movies are, are a wonderful blessing and it's amazing to work on them, but they can be stressful and things move fast and sometimes you're your best self and sometimes you're less than your best self and I will readily admit that I was not always my best self under stress, um, but you kind of wish like that Andrew is the high water mark, that you know, he was his best self and it is to his endless credit that the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit films succeed as high fantasy that is still realistic enough and photographed so beautifully enough that we can enter into that world through his imagery. Yeah. To, to Leslie's endless, endless credit. Um, describe your first impression of meeting Christopher Lee. Wow, I was super intimidated the first time I met him. Yeah. He's tall. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm very short, but he's tall, and he, but he's unbelievably elegant. He's the best dinner you will ever have. His stories, his lamest story is someone else's best story. Yeah, yeah. really? He's just, he's had such an amazing life. He's so elegant and classy, yes. and he's just endlessly wonderful to spend time with. I, I have been told that, and we've seen it in the behind the scenes of The Hobbit, on the Spirit of the Journey, that when Peter, when Peter and Sir Christopher sit together and start bantering and telling anecdotes, that most of the production shuts down because they won't stop talking. Correct. <laughs> yeah, true. no, for sure. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. Even with all the other assistants and the people saying, come on, we've got to get this shot, they still be talking and sharing stories. Yeah, well, there's always stuff on a big wheel that there's always stuff to set up, but yeah, yeah for sure. They were great together. A bit of ugly business, perhaps. Um, the SAG Award for Best Ensemble was awarded at the Return of the King to every single actor who was in the cast, the lead cast, including Miranda Otto, Sean Bean, uh, you know, John Noble, everybody from top tier on down. But unfortunately, because the theatrical cut of the Return of the King did not include the ultimate, the, the scene where Saruman meets his fate, and those 12 or 15 minutes were cut, it is so sad to say that Christopher Lee did not share his name in that SAG award. Yeah. Do you think posthumously we could probably get something done to change that? Ooh, I think that's an awesome idea. Because I personally am strongly motivated, and I'm still pissed off over all these years. I will join forces with you to do that. I will join that effort. Would you? Sure. All right, then great. Then we have, that's excellent. Then it's, it's a bit of beautiful business. Yeah. We've turned ugly business into beautiful business. Yeah. That's very, very good. Um, I feel passionately about that because Christopher Lee, before he left us, should have had his Oscar. He should have had that acknowledgement at that scale, not just the BAFTA for his life achievement, but you agree? Yeah, totally agree. I think we all thought he would be around forever. Um, and it's actually, it's, a, it's important to, to seize the day, because he certainly did, but you know, appreciate people while they're here, no matter how long they seem. 
in light of Saruman's character and the way we're introduced to him in the Fellowship of the Ring, do you think it's helpful for newbies to experience Saruman first in the Hobbit trilogy and then see how things change by the time we get to him? Because it's a very quick turn right. from good guy to traitor in Fellowship. What yes, it's a very quick turn. I actually hadn't thought about that, but now that, I'm, now that you put it to me, yes, mm -hmm. I think it could be excellent. Because you would definitely see an evolution. <laughs> Indeed, yeah, I do. Yeah. In, you don't know anything about the extended version of The Hobbit coming out. They, no, the, the upcoming Battle of the Five Armies. No. But let me ask you this, as a fan, because mm. I know you're still a Tolkien fan Big time. at heart. Would you think it was really, really cool to see an extra scene of Christopher Lee at Dol Guldur finding the Palantir in the rubble after Sauron after is in his bed? Wouldn't are that be so cool? Are you saying that that scene exists? No, I'm just saying that would be the coolest thing ever. Oh, this, is, yeah. this is just the fanboy me saying what would be cool. I would like you about to say that I'm supposed to call Peter now and say, so, did you put that scene in? Like, and he'd say, like, why are you calling You can't. You've got his number on your speaker. I definitely have that, and I'm so not calling it right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, Mark, I'm changing my number now. <laughs> it's weird. Like, no. <laughs> That's called Peter right now. Say, well, it's. It's really, really lovely to have all the fans in the community come together. Yeah. Have you noticed this aspect over all of your years of association with the Tolkien family? You've noticed yeah, this? Yeah, always, from the very, very beginning. From the very beginning of early days in, in Cannes, the, 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 when we had all the footage in 2001. That blew everyone away. Yeah. So, John, for those of you who don't know, I'll let Mark tell the story. It's fantastic. That footage you showed Yeah, that was the footage that we chose to, to sort of launch the, the movies to the world media. Um, and it had that screening gone poorly, it, you know, you know how things are. This, the world works even faster now. It would have been terrible if that footage had not landed. And it landed so hard, so well. Oh yeah, I used to describe it as a shot heard around the world. And I remember our French distributor, I already told this story, I'm wondering about it, so apologies. But our French distributor was so happy, he picked me up by the arms and kissed me <laughs> on the mouth. <laughs> no time. Uh, <laughs> At least he, if he had bought you a drink first. Yeah, for sure. He literally had me, and like he was so excited. But it was a great, amazing night. That's fantastic. In case you didn't know, the entire chamber of Mazarbul, where they discover Balin's tomb, and the encounter with the orcs, and the first few moments of the encounter with Balrog, were what was shown at camp. Right. And it was way before Fellowship of the Ring was released. New Line managed to finance the film entirely by pre-sales to yeah. foreign territories. Is right. that correct? That's correct. So, so we, it was really important to keep the it foreign territories. It was important for that to work. All, all, all those companies had it not worked, apart from New Line's Jeopardy, those companies would have been in, in, in real Jeopardy as well. Was this the biggest career risk you've ever taken? Yes, for, films? for sure. And what was the biggest life lesson you came out of? The biggest life lesson was actually the films, because yeah. right before these films, I had i had been, been pursuing another project unrelated to this, and I second-guessed myself, and I ended up, being, ended up being a terrible, terrible mistake. I was, I made a terrible mistake. I was very wrong, and I wasn't nearly fired over, but I nearly lost my kind of operational autonomy over this terrible mistake. I managed to recover from it, and I remember thinking, all right, the next time you have a real conviction that is grounded and foundational, do not second guess yourself. So when this came along, we were already developing it at that point, but I literally made the decision that it was the last thing I did in my movie business career, so be it, because I wasn't gonna let it go. And um, I, you know, that was an important thing to do. So and all, everything I've done turned out really, really well. There was that level of conviction. Everything I did that I did a little more casually didn't always turn out as well. Anything you can tell us about what you might be working on? The Quest on ABC was a fantastic thing, by the way. Let's have a round of applause. It was so cool to see a competition reality show set in an RPG style. Well, it was inspired by the, by the early uh, pre-production training of like Orlando Bloom and Billy and Dom and Elijah and Sean, they were all down doing horse camp and sword camp and archery camp and I would get these VHS videos. Can you imagine? Boy, that really dates it. Did you just say VHS? Yeah, this was 1998, so they would FedEx me VHS tapes to show the progress, how everyone was doing. And um, my producing partner now, Jane Fleming, got really digging, like, why does everyone want to dig in to go to horse camp and sword camp? And like, why can't real people go to horse camp and sword camp? And so the quest was essentially seated in that moment. So the idea that we could take real people and give them to be fully immersed in fantasy experience, that was the thought.
still no worry about what might be the next iteration of the quest? No, unfortunately, ABC had neither renewed it nor canceled it, so it's in a bit of a limbo. It is on Netflix, which is nice. Which is fantastic, yes. yes. Which is cool. One of, one of my wonderful girlfriends, Bonnie, Palette yes. Bonnie, Bonnie, who I, I worked with her for a number of years at the Magic Castle in Hollywood. Um, she is so fantastic. She's a voiceover talent. Yep. Like, you wouldn't believe the, the cartoon character voices that she can do. Uh, she puts me to shame, mm -hmm. and I've done voice work for years. Yeah, Bonnie's fantastic. I'm so glad to see girl power yeah. and sure. female fandom represented so well in the quest. No, for sure. That was the whole point of it. To, yes. to embrace diversity. Fantasy is not always a diverse genre, so with the quest we had the opportunity for gender diversity, racial diversity, body diversity, that like we wanted it to look like the world, and not just like, we all love Lord of the Rings and it's fantastic, but we, we had an opportunity to invent something that wasn't already existing, yes. and that was important. We all thought Sean had a lock on the wind. We thought he did too. I thought so. That was part of the fun of the show, that we all thought that Sean had a lock yes. on that wind. But hey, yeah, that's it girl does. power. That's right. That's girl right. power in the end, mm -hmm. right? So let me ask you next, what might be on the, besides television, what might right. be in the future for future films for you? Gosh. Um, we're always developing heaps of stuff. I mean, we have a great thriller that we're trying to put together in London. There's like a, a, a sort of Italian job as thriller we're hoping to shoot in London next year, which would be great. With a big car chase in the Mini Coopers? Car chase, I love cons it. within cons, yes. always. Yes. We're working, we have a Blumhouse horror movie that we may do this fall, because I like making horror movies. I mean, Peter Jackson and I met because of the horror kind of splatter movies that he made. That's how I met him in the first place. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you think Meet the Feebles will ever get a release on a nice clean Blu-ray? Come on. I have no idea. Who, I don't know who holds the rights. That is a weird question. It's probably convoluted. Yes. Probably not. <laughs> okay. Moving on to the Silmarillion. And this will be my last question. Yes? And then you can embarrass me with I have to bring it on. And then we may get a chance for one or two quick questions from the audience, and then we'll begin with the two towers. But the Silmarillion could not possibly be adapted because, well, as we know, the Tolkien estate will not release the rights right. for any radio, television, or film. Mm -hmm. We know that once upon a time, many, many decades ago, the tale of Baron and Luthien was adapted by, um, I believe, a Polish or a Czechoslovakian ballet company. And they made a lovely ballet based on the whole tale of Baron and Luthien. But that's the only time the Tolkien estate has ever had the silver only that we know a lot about English. Right. So, what would you like to see? A television format, like HBO's Game of Thrones? Would you yeah. like to see a multiple film series? No, I actually think if, if one was lucky enough to do it, to do like multiple hours, 10 hours. I mean, I'm a big fan of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell. I, I developed that new line. Yes. And seeing that in a seven, and I was trying to make a three hour, one film version of that. Really? Yeah, and Julian um, so Fellows, yeah, really Fellows adapted it, and I lost the rights. But then my, that, the point is, yes, to see a seven or a 10 hour, or whatever's appropriate, mm. it would be best. So you think the Silver Ring might not be might, might not fare as well in future. I'm not sure because you can't even just do well, where what story would you tell? I mean, like you know, it's same with like children of Hurin, like you know, exactly. you have to pick your pick your spot. Exactly. Well, I, I think that in the middle of the cinematic universe, mm. I think the Warner Brothers is not done yet. They still have the rights to everything that's in the appendix or the appendices at the back of Return of the King. Yeah. So we might even see like a young Nick Aragorn and a young Legolas buddy movie where they go on the hunt for all. Don't put it past them because they still have the rights to do this. That is true. Isn't it? Yeah, they definitely own the rights so to do this. Do you like think it's a red herring that Fred Will says to Legolas, you need to go and meet this guy? He's the son of Arathorn. You're going to find out what his real name is. The, wait, Battle of the Five Armies comes to a screeching halt so that Fred Will can drop this dialogue. Right. It's not a red herring. I'm telling you people now, be prepared for Warner Brothers to come out with something sooner or later. We talked about this at Comic Con. Yeah, no. What do you think? I, just, I think Peter Jackson is incredibly mischievous, and I think anything is possible. Yes, he is. Anything is yes. possible. Just like, just like Miyazaki, who says, I'm going to retire, and he makes some film. <laughs> and he's going to retire. But Peter Jackson says, I'm retired from Middle Earth. But we don't know. No. Oh. He wasn't even going to direct the Hobbit. And then he did. Yeah. yeah. OK. Like one, one or two very quick questions from the audience. Please, yes, sir. Um, so I'm like fascinated from a producer standpoint from where you're at in the industry. Mm -hmm. I think there's something to be said for how these films were made and how they stand the test of time because everything was done 
for real. You know, like the miniature work and the way that this film was made is just what's going to let it outlast so many other. You know, like this viewing was amazing to see how many shots just still looked good. And I know, like now is a time in the film industry where so many people are saying, "Well, this just can't happen anymore. Like films can't be made this way anymore." And I didn't think about the end of this question, but like, you know, what what. Like as a producer, what do you like? How do you see this progress? Because I think there's something like personally, I was growing up when I saw these movies, not the Hobbit. And I think these are going to age ten times better than the Hobbit films. So yeah, I mean, films always get made around the way the particular filmmaker wants to make them. As a producer, like I'm very filmmaker driven, so like when Peter wants to do it this way, that's how we're doing it. And he was working on, I mean, Bad Taste featured a miniature. When that house look takes off at the end, it's a miniature. So he was always going to do that. He was finding very creative ways to use it. As expensive as the movies were, they were not, there could have always been more money. So the way he used miniatures or bigatures, as he used to like to call them, um, was fascinating. I agree with you. I love the rich graininess of the movies, and I think it, it sustains. But I wouldn't rule out the films could be made this way again. I think it all depends. But it always comes down to the film and the filmmaker. There's usually not some institutional mandate. As long as it feels like there is, but there really isn't. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Okay. And we have one last question for you. Let's move on to our next film in the marathon. Yes, I'm for you, sir. Uh, just because it's such a big part of the movie, can you talk about uh, how the score kind of developed and how your relationship to it? I didn't have much relationship to it, but I, I can speak to the score that I love the fact that when Howard Shore was hired to do this, not like Andrew Leslie, this was not an obvious choice. Like the obvious choice we all know would have been there would have been different composers you would have thought to do it. I mean Howard Shore had scored seven at New Line and a bunch of other movies too. And I think the fact that Peter found oh going back to Heavenly Creatures, he you know, Peter can cast and find people who don't seem superficially like they would be a match. Mm -hmm. And they end up being beyond a match. They end up being perfect. Indeed. I think that was Howard Shore. Really Paul Bruchek at New Line and Rick Porras, who was the co-producer, they dealt with Howard more than I did. I love Rick. How's Rick? Rick is great. He's great. He's a good guy. He's cute and cheesy. He's such a nice guy. I don't yeah. he, he'd laugh. Your yeah. Guy. Look, it's funny, I believe that Peter was talking to James Warner or maybe some other composers before oh, Yeah, but you all listen, we, we talked to Sean Connery about being get off. Or, yeah, so I mean, there's always, when you're making movies, you're always like, oh, I'll talk to you, you know, and it ends up landing where it lands. But that was what Harry Knowles wanted more than anything. <laughs> really? Before the Mummy <laughs> got Sean Connery? Before the Mummy got Ned began, when most fans was hanging around me at Cool News, the earliest whispers of the Lord of the Rings yeah. going into pre production came from Harry. Yeah. And that's how we started. We started getting excited about what was yeah. going on. And he put this goofy picture of Sean Connery with a Photoshop kit. I'll have it over yeah. there. I remember that very clearly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember shipping the script to, I think it was in Jamaica or it was on an island somewhere. Yes. I was a bit very nervous. But, um, now, to, to, your, to my big surprise, and maybe to yours, we have at least 15 or 16 people who are brand new and have never seen the world of the so, That is brilliant. I'm so, so glad that you, you folks are here. What do you want to prepare them for as we go to the second chapter? Sure. I, I, will, I won't say anything that ruins anything. The reason I specifically wanted to introduce this film, um, and this might resonate more for people who have already seen it, this was the film that proved to me, proved Peter's talents even more than The Fellowship or Turn of the King, because editorially, this film was a far bigger challenge. It was the middle film. It was a real struggle editorially. There were moments in the early part of editorial of this movie where it was by no means obvious how well it was going to turn out. And the digging deep in editorial, Peter and Fran. I was in this, I was blessed enough to go to Peter Jackson University. I was in the editing room every day, sitting on the floor, like just watching this film and how it turned out and its power was is a real testimony to Peter's skills because it was not and it was not an easy, smooth birth. And yet it turned out so well. And I think even though most people love Turn of the King best, I love this film best mostly because I know how hard won the victory of it is. Um, and that's probably, so that's why I wanted to do it, because I know, I know how hard it was. I'm really, really, really pleased and so thrilled to have you here oh, today. Please, so thrilled, pleased to be here. Mark Rodeski, ladies and gentlemen. Ian, Ian, I have to say, well done. Well done. Thank you. 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 Thank you.